Hello, everybody. We're going to wait another minute or so just to let everybody hop on. Welcome to part five of our Gardening with Florida Friendly Principles series. Tonight we'll be talking about attracting wildlife. Hi, Robin. It's like, you know what we're gonna ask. Yes, we are most definitely your friends, Robin. I dig it. <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If folks are late, folks are late. Uh, we do try to start promptly at seven. Again, tonight is Attracting Wildlife, part five, or principle five of our Gardening with Florida Friendly Principles. So as many of you know at this point, my name is Katie Harper. I am one of PASCO's Florida Friendly Landscaping Program coordinators. I am based out of Dade City and I work mostly with uh, homeowners associations and I also am a certified arborist. So I work a lot with calls about tree care, um, tree concerns, things like that, as well as a, I am a healthy pond, man, healthy pond manager as well. And so I work with communities and municipalities on getting their stormwater ponds and other uh, bodies of water up to healthy standards. And so with me tonight is my colleague, Kyle Christmas, and I will let him go ahead and introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. For those of you who are returning, hello if you're new. Uh, my name is Kyle Christmas. I run the Community Gardens Program for the Pasco Extension Office here on the east side of the county. Uh, the community garden is uh, program is uh, you know an up and coming program and it is slowly spreading throughout Pasco County. If anybody ever wants to get involved, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. And as always, thank you so much for collaborating with me. I'm always excited to share the, the Florida friendly principles because they do translate not only to our landscaping but to all types of gardening and green spaces. So thank you again, as always. So as I mentioned, tonight is week five. We are talking about principle number five, attracting wildlife. Next week, we have managing yard pests responsibly, followed by recycling, reducing stormwater runoff, and then protecting, protecting our waterfront. So you all know, I love to do our introductions with you guys too. So let me know in the chat where you're from, what's the coolest wildlife you've seen in your yard and wildlife you're hoping to attract. Go ahead and drop it in the chat and let's see what y'all got going on. So let us know where you're from, the coolest wildlife you've seen in your yard, and the wildlife you're hoping to attract. For those of us just joining us, tonight is week five of our Gardening with Florida Friendly Landscaping Principles. We're discussing uh, attracting wildlife. And so it is now your turn to introduce yourselves. Where are you from? The coolest wildlife you've seen in your yard and the wildlife you're hoping to attract. 
Darla wants to attract butterflies in Newport Ritchie. Robin, she has raccoons visiting, but hoping to attract butterflies. We have more butterflies in Newport Ritchie. Good thing we may or may not be talking about butterflies tonight, ladies. All right, let's go ahead and keep moving. <laughs> We're finding out we got neighbors on here. That's so exciting. All right. So wildlife, why? Why does that matter whenever we're talking about gardening and edible gardens? Well, most fruit and vegetable crops need to be pollinated. So that is the main focus that I'm going to be driving home today is wildlife equals pollinators. In tonight's discussion, that is going to be the main topic. There are other things that we could discuss about biodiversity and Florida's um, ever, ever expanding urbanization. And I can, I can talk about wildlife and FFL and go in so many different directions. But, but tonight, with our topic of edible gardens, we're going to be talking specifically about pollinators, because in order for us to have a fruitful and productful, productful garden, we need to have pollinators. So pollinators, butterflies and moths. This is what most people tend to think about. And so in Florida, we have over 180 verified species of butterflies and over 170 70 of those are native. And we have roughly 40 that are unique to Florida specifically, which I think is crazy and super, super cool. And so butterflies are, they're so diverse for us here in this region. And so Florida is actually one of the number one states. If you're looking to have a butterfly garden, you will have the largest variety of butterflies uh, as opposed to almost anywhere else in the United States. Now, things we need to think about when we're thinking about butterflies is the entire life stage of a butterfly. It's not just um, adults flying around, visiting your flowers and looking all pretty. They go through an entire life cycle, including the egg, the larval stage, pupa, through adulthood. And so we need to make sure that if you want butterflies, you're also supplying the food or the fuel that they need at all points of their life stage. And so that also includes plants for the larval stage to eat. So that means that oftentimes we need to push past our our mental block where we see plants being chomped on and allow for that to occur because we need our caterpillars to have something to eat. And so if your focus is on butterflies, and I'm not going to get into individual species here because each butterfly species actually does have a preferred host for its larval stage um, as well as adult. And so that's going to, I'm going to leave that to you guys to do your own research. And actually some of the resources that I have included at the end of the presentation go specifically into gardening for butterflies here in Florida. And they can tell you the preferred host for all the different life stages. So that way, if you have a favorite butterfly or moth, you can plant according to that. But um, just know that you do need to plant also for that larval stage because it, it's only one, one part of it if you're attracting the adults and they're laying their eggs, if those eggs hatch and there's no way to complete that life cycle, then um, it's not gonna be nearly as beneficial for us or for them. We have native bees. And I always love this slide because it shows you just how diverse bees can be and how they don't look like what we think a bee looks like. Some of these look like flies. They're, they're camouflaged as flies or as beetles to protect themselves, but they are uh, coming in and pollinating as well. And something that's unique about our native bees that we don't really think about, I, I guess we always think, at least in my mind, I tend to think about honeybees and how honeybees are in hives. Oftentimes those are man-made hives. Well, honeybees are the only types of bees that live in a man-made hive. Most of our native pollinators actually burrow into, uh, they have burrows under the ground. And so things we need to be aware of as we're talking about our native bees uh, specifically is, you know, doing away with our plastic bed liners or our plastic 
um, weed guards and things like that. Because these bees, they need to be able to get access to the ground or they need to be able to get out. And so it really does uh, benefit us to do away, with, do away with those plastic liners and just use something like mulch or another natural covering to help keep those weeds at bay. And another thing with them being creating burrows in the ground is to also minimize your lawn treatments. Instead of doing those blanket insecticide sprays over your lawn, spot treat as needed. And so that way you're not doing damage that is unnecessary. And we'll talk more about that here in, in a minute. Now, pollinators, um, honeybees. Honeybees specifically. Now, I was looking into the types of plants that really, the honeybees really like here in our part of Florida. And the ones that would be most relevant to our gardening would actually be fruit trees and berries. So it's going to be your plums, your dates, your, your peaches, your apples, your cherries, your blackberries, um, your hackberry. Uh, there's another, there's a couple other ones. And then also Yopon, Yopon holly. Uh, and I included that one because you can grow Yopon holly and you can actually harvest the leaves and use them as tea. And so it actually has a natural source of caffeine and it's supposed to have a, a really cool, unique taste to it as well. And so something to explore if you guys haven't heard of Yopon Holly yet. Wasps. Now, this is one that a lot of you probably don't think about. And you probably see these wasps and you might freak out a little bit. Well, they're also pollinators and they also need to eat. They're not all out there to eat us. And so don't fret. They're there. They're friend. And uh, I don't have a whole lot of information. I do have a little spot on wasps here coming up um, a little later as well. Now flies, flies are always fun for me, diptera. Um, and it's, <laughs> it cracks me up because you have bees that camouflage themselves as flies and then you have flies that camouflage themselves as bees. Then you just have flies and then you just have bees. So there's a whole bunch of different things flying around. Um, but again, and you can actually see a trend here if you look at these photos, the types of flowers that flies actually like. They love those lighter colored, open, um, easy to access flowers, often panicled or in small groups. And so that really does attract them and so that they can get in and easily access that pollen. Beetles. Beetles are also fun. Um, I see a ladybird in there um, and there's a couple others. Uh, beetles like a wide variety of flowers, but oftentimes they are open or panicled uh, just for easy access as well. Now hummingbirds. They're, hummingbirds are only native to the Americas, which was something that I learned today as I was uh, doing a little extra research. There's actually only 16 found in the United States, and we only have three that occur in Florida. There's a couple other species that migrate further south throughout the year, but ultimately we have three that are a uh, prevalent species. Now hummingbirds actually need to consume large amounts of uh, high energy food and for them that's that nectar. And I talked about trends in flower types with the other pollinators and you can actually see a trend here. You see how they are those, those trumpet shaped flowers that are brightly colored. Now Hummingbirds aren't born with a preference to flower type. They just learn with age and with experience that they can get the most bang for their buck with these orange, red, and scarlet colored flowers. And so with their real long skinny beak, they're actually able to stick their, their beaks down those trumpet flowers and stick out their tongue and lap up a whole bunch of nectar. And so um, it always, it amazes me. They need to eat every 10 to 15 minutes. And at night, they actually go into a state of almost hibernation where they slow down all of their body functions and their body temperature. And they actually hibernate almost every night. Otherwise, they would likely starve to death because they wouldn't be able to fly and feed themselves in, in the nighttime. So as I mentioned, the ideal flower color for hummingbirds is red, orange, or pink. And uh, yeah, they, a fun fact, they've also been known to show interest in red colored lipstick, fingernail polish, and clothing as well. And so they are really attracted to that color just through association. 
They're smart little creatures. Now there are keys to attracting and keeping pollinators. It's one thing to see something fly through your yard. It's another thing to have it live and thrive in your yard. So we're gonna talk about these four points, food, shelter, recognizing the good bugs and acceptable damage and minimizing pesticides. Now, I really want to make sure that you all are planting a variety of flower shapes and sizes. I know most of you said that you were interested in butterflies, but it takes all kinds to make the world go round and that applies to our pollinators as well. And so I'm really going to encourage you to, if you want a pollinator friendly garden, then plant a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors, as well as blooms that are available throughout the year. One thing that we see, especially uh, not necessarily in edible gardens. Well, actually, yeah, edible gardens. We do have uh, like dead zones throughout the year where we aren't actively uh, raising a crop in our space. But if we can have other flowers um, going to help motivate and keep those pollinators present, then that really does help. We have issues with our large right of ways, um, both for power lines and roadways, even yards. Yards can be a, a monoculture where it's just turf and maybe one type of bush and it's, it's barren. There's no food there. There's no color. There's no vibrancy. There's no variety. And so our pollinators have nowhere to go. And so we actually see a large number of pollinators starving in areas where there is that monoculture where we don't have the variety that they need. And like I said, color counts. Bees love purples and yellows and whites and they can't really distinguish red from green though. They're like red green colorblind, which is kind of crazy to me. And like I mentioned, hummingbirds love red and so do butterflies. Uh, butterflies and hummingbirds, um, red flowers, uh, bee balm is really popular for them. And then bees love yellow and white flowers. And then our smaller native bees actually prefer uh, smaller flowers, not, not anything big and gaudy, but uh, the much smaller cone flowers and things like that are bumblebees. You know how they're, they're big and they're burly? Well, they also a lot like those larger flowers where they can crawl in there and muscle themselves down to where that nectar is. They're able to do that uh, as opposed to some of our smaller bee species. Bee species. Um, now, unlike our bees, our butterflies and our moths use our gardens to raise their young. We talked about that. And so monarch butterflies will feed on the nectar of many flowers, but will only lay their eggs on milkweed. And so uh, things to keep in mind is there's a variety of different types of milkweed if you're interested in uh, monarchs. And as I mentioned, diversifying our bloom time. You can see here is a chart. Um, I'm sorry if it's fuzzy. I just wanted you all to be able to see the, the graph and not worry about the species. Um, but the early and late blooming flowers, so you can see that there's always something in bloom in that space throughout the year. And that's gonna be uh, really important if you guys want to have a, a fruitful garden and attract butterflies. Now, uh, bee pollinators do prefer to collect nectar from the same plants in a single trip. They are not gonna jump from one flower to another type of plant to another type of plant. They're gonna stick with the same type of plant. That's what our research has shown. And so try to plant clusters of the same type of plants together, but often not more than a couple feet here or there. We're looking at roughly seven to five plants in the same of the same species grouped together. And so um, we call that flower constancy. And so it, it does group it and creates a, a constant presence there so they can pop in, do all the foraging they can do in a trip and then pop back out and, and take that back to their hive. And something else you can do is create microclimates. I just gave a, a talk on biodiversity uh, the other day. And one thing we talked about was uh, not just the diversity within a given landscape, but the diversity in a single plant. And the example was a fir tree and how there's multiple species of birds that benefit from living in the different levels of, of that tree. 
And so microclimates allow for us to do that as well, where we're able to shelter our, 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 our plants and our pollinators. It, it protects them from prevailing winds and it allows, um, especially if you plant your garden in the southeastern side of your property, it allows for more degree days. And so it allows for them to be more active as well, as well as go through more life stages more rapidly, as opposed to planting in a shadier part of your property where they're not gonna get as much sun or it could be windy and they can't even reach your flowers. So providing some shelter is really uh, beneficial. Next, we have our nesting opportunities. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, honeybees are one of the only species that live in a man-made uh, hive, but we can source other types of nests and, and shelters for our bees to overwinter. Um, some examples could be, you know, preserving dead or dying trees or shrubs, um, leaving stems whenever you do your spring cleanup, leaving some of the stems instead of cutting back to the ground, um, and then maintaining a, a water source, such as like a bird bath or a water garden, because even our pollinators need access to water. And in Florida, it gets hot, in case you haven't heard. <laughs> now, next understanding that a little injury is okay. I want you to be careful. I don't want you to panic whenever you see a little bit of damage on your plants. It's completely, it, it's okay, it's natural. Plants have natural enemies that feed on them and it just, it, it, the life cycle is complete. Um, but as you see here, these semi-circle cutouts, those actually aren't from caterpillars. Those are from leaf cutter bees which actually take those leaves back to their nests uh, and they use those as part of their, uh, as part of their, their nest. And so that, those leaves of, that's a bean plant. Those bean plants might look like Swiss cheese for a hot second, but they'll recover. It's not doing any uh, major damage, but again, that's a pollinator. And it's very similar to how if you want to have butterflies, you're going to have to have plants there that the larva can feed on and you have to be okay with letting those plants get eaten. Now, do I want all your plants to get eaten? No, but it's also understanding uh, good bads, good bugs from bad bugs. Now, I love this picture. That's a little caterpillar up there. Um, I forget what type of moth that's from, but what he does is he pulls uh, pieces of the flower that they're eating and he camouflages himself with it. And it may look like he's doing a whole lot of harm, but ultimately he's just camouflaging himself and a little bit of injury is okay. We need to allow for our, our threshold to drop a little bit uh, to be able to make our garden more friendly for our pollinators and ultimately for our water sources as well. Now I wanna make sure that we are going to be minimizing our pesticide usage. And by doing that, uh, we need to leverage integrated pest management or IPM. And so we really need to lean on right plant, right place because stress plants attract more pests, both insects and diseases. And we need to identify any problems early. You need to scout your garden. You need to be aware of what's going on. You can't just leave it and then hope that it does fine and then freak out whenever something's not right a, a week or so after it started. You need to be able to identify it right at the source, identify what's going on and figure out the best way to, to handle that situation. And if you do need to use a pesticide, please do it in a targeted way and with the least toxic method. And remember that label is the law. We will be talking more about pesticide usage, how to read those labels, um, how to use that next week. Next week, I will not be here next weekend. Um, next week for our managing pests responsibly. Um, and again, as I mentioned, minimize those lawn treatments. Now we say minimize our, our, uh, our pesticide usage because there are insects like what I have shown here. So does anybody know what that bug is in the top left corner? Does anybody know what that is? That little black and orange creature? I got a nope. Okay. It is 
a ladybug larva. That is what the adolescent stage of a ladybug looks like. And it looks real fierce, but it's there munching on a whole bunch of aphids. I'm not sure if y'all can see them, but we actually have um, aphids sprinkled in up here through these flowers that this uh, ladybug larva is actually going up through and eating. And so um, a, a lot of folks mistake this as a quote unquote bad bug, when in reality it's going in and doing you guys a whole bunch of favors. Um, and actually this right here is um, a type of fly that actually, actually this is a wasp that parasitizes uh, caterpillars and aphids. And so if this little one you guys can't see, but this one is gray and can you guys see my laser pointer? I hope so. Okay, I think you can. Um, but this caterpillar has been parasitized. No, Thank you, Kyle, has been parasitized. And then this little aphid right here has also been parasitized as well. And so that means that this wasp goes in and lays eggs into a host insect. And then the eggs hatch and the larva actually eat those bugs from the inside out and pretty much mum mummify them, mummify them and uh, basically kill them. And then they hatch and then they go and kill more bugs for us. And so there are ways and uh, ways to combat things like aphids and unwanted caterpillars. Uh, we just need to make sure that we are providing the environment for them to be able to come in to thrive. Uh, because a lot of pesticides, even if you're there trying to kill, trying to address one specific type of bug, it will have an impact on multiple others in the environment as well. Ooh, Darla saw it happened on her collard green plant. That's so exciting. Take pictures, girl. Send it in. Well, if it happens this year, send, take pictures and send them to us. We're always looking for good pictures. And that goes for any of you guys. If you ever have photos of your gardens, of cool things going on, cool bugs, wildlife, anything like that, please don't hesitate to send that in. We're always looking for, for cool things to highlight and success stories and, and all of that, especially if it's something that you've learned from one of our talks, uh, being able to identify pests and things like that, or you know your garden's doing well with, with advice that we were able to give you, please, 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 please let us know. We always love knowing that we made a difference in your lives. Am I saying that some caterpillars are bad? Yeah, some caterpillars are bad. Some moths, um, some some moths and some caterpillars, they come in and they uh, they wreck um, they wreck tree canopies, or they are uh, like the white tussock moth caterpillars that we just had uh, all throughout Central Florida a couple weeks ago um, through March and into April. They're like the white fuzzy ones. They chew up our ash, our, our oak trees, and then they also also cause extreme allergic reactions with humans and pets and other animals. And so, and they just poop everywhere. They eat everything and they poop everywhere and they give you an allergic reaction. Um, and so, yeah, there are some that aren't good. Uh, and that goes with, with all bugs. You know, there's some bees that we don't like. There's some bees that we love. Um, not all butterflies and moths are, um, are good. You'll just have to take a look and do some research as to the butterflies and the moths that we have here in Central Florida. Uh, there are so many, which is why I can't really dive into that. So uh, Darla asked, how do we know which butterflies, moths, caterpillars, et cetera, are beneficial? And so that's just doing a little bit of of extra research. We have, <laughs> we have a whole lot here in Florida. We have over 180 species of butterflies or moths, um, and that's not including our, our invasive species. So there's a whole lot to cover there. <laughs> Maybe another day. <laughs> well, and, and don't forget folks, um, you know, if uh, you, need to, uh, you need help trying to identify, you know, we have a lot of people here at the Extension Office. Uh, if you can get a picture of it, um, you know, then uh, we can uh, definitely uh, help you identify them or find somebody who can. Yes, definitely. And if it's fuzzy, please don't touch it. Please, 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 please don't touch it. Uh, <laughs> I've learned from experience and also just from, you know, working with butterfly farmers, that's actually a thing, 
um, and just hearing from folks, you know, if, if it's fuzzy, please don't touch it. Unless you're up north and it's a woolly bear, don't touch the fuzzy ones down here. No fun. But that is what I have for y'all today uh, in relation to attracting wildlife to your garden here in Florida, utilizing Florida friendly principles. Next week, we'll be talking about yard pests and how to manage those responsibly. I'll try to address things like uh, armadillos, um, not nice pests. So Darla, next week, we'll be talking about unwanted, unwanted insect pests and how to manage those responsibly. And uh, do you guys have anything else? Um, the recorded ones are on YouTube. We have them private right now because we need to get the closed captioning on those. And uh, if you guys could please, uh, these are our resources. Hold on, I will, I will get to the chat here in a second. If you guys would like to screenshot the resources, here they are. And then here is Kyle and I's information. If y'all would like access to this talk, please email us and we will send you the link. Um, it is not available to the public yet because we do need to get our closed captioning on there. We need to be ADA compliant. And so it does take some time for us to get those up and available to the public, but we can send you the recordings once we have them up. I am about two weeks behind in getting them uploaded to YouTube. So the first three are up and available, but the last two I think are not up, but we're working on that. And so um, thank you all for that. Um, any other questions about uh, pollinators or wildlife in general, anything like that? Don't forget, if anybody wants help creating a uh, pollinator garden to help track uh, pollinators uh, towards your uh, garden, uh, we have plenty of resources here through the Extension Office. Please feel free to reach out to Katie or myself and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction or get you those resources. What he said. <laughs> yeah, if you if, if y'all have goals, we can work with you on those goals, whether it's with your edible garden or your landscape, that's what we're here for. We are a free resource for you all. And as always, thank you so much for giving us time out of your Thursday evenings. We know your time is precious. And so thank you for spending it with Kyle and I. I hope you learned a little something about pollinators and wildlife and attracting those to your garden. Shoot me an email, Robin. So A, I do not have that link up yet. Um, I will get that out as soon as it's up. I do not have it up yet. And so I couldn't send it out. And so I apologize for not um, getting back to you sooner on that. But yeah, I don't have that one up yet. <laughs> I'm working on it guys, I'm working on it. Well, if we don't have any specific questions, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna go, we're gonna wrap up. Um, thank you guys so much. I love that we're able to keep these down to roughly 35 minutes. It's a just short little awesome little blast of information. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to talk about next week. Next week is gonna be, oh, uh, thanks Robin. Robin says this was her favorite episode. And I love that we're calling these episodes there is nine of them, so it is like a, a TV show. <laughs> we really appreciate everybody uh, being here. Thank you all so much. Look forward to seeing you guys all in the next one. We will be having a survey go out. Um, thank you to those of you who have been filling those out and getting those back to us in a timely fashion. I really do appreciate that feedback and it helps us know what y'all learn and what you want to know and helps guide us. So thank you for filling out those surveys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off. So thank you guys so much for your evening and we will see you next week, Thursday at 7 PM. Have a good evening, everyone. Have a good night.